So my goal today is to, even though two of you may not have seen it yet, or seen pieces, I'm not quite sure, because I've been trying to feed everything into my personal website. Whenever I say personal website, it sounds kind of creepy, frankly, but my my own website, my professional website, um, so that you'll be able to get stuff there. But I will, as soon as I figure out how to do it, I'll mirror everything into that directed studies Canvas site so you can submit the labs and all that through there because it's a lot easier to do it that way. So let me just share right now lab one because there's a obviously there's a couple of things at the beginning that are not related to using R and that. I just want to make sure everybody's good with those before we go into R. So And it, it's really, you know, in this, in this uh, safe place, it's really good if, if you just say, haven't started it, haven't even thought about it, what the heck are you talking about here or whatever. Just be completely honest about what you're experiencing. I want everybody to get A plus in this course. I don't care about distribution of marks or anything like that. But um, you actually have to do the work I'm not saying that. Uh, I even have a thing that if you totally blow a question on a lab, you can, if you have time, you can resubmit it, given my comments, and I'll remark it. So there's no reason why, as long as you're willing to commit to uh, doing stuff, there's no reason why you shouldn't get an A+. Plus. Okay, that was great. Great start up there, Bob. Meanwhile, I'll just find lab one. So just talk among yourselves for a moment while I get my stuff together here. So it's the color brewer one that you're thinking of, or the different palettes? Just different colors of every palette. If you get into that that GG plot book, um, and one of the cool things, and as many of you know, I'm colorblind, so there's different what they call palettes in R. So when you're making uh, graphs for usually presentations, it's the main one, and there's actually high contrast. You know, this line followed by that, or, or colorblind sensitive choices. So if you're doing something like plotting by groups, it'll pick colors that are amenable. But yeah, it's that that's the thing about it. I mean it it is a lot more intimidating to get into than you know SPSS or the standard kind of canned packages, but um lots of great flexibility in creating uh plots and stuff that are great for conferences or or published papers for that. Let me, I'm just going to share my whole desktop and for Omar and Judy. So what I'm going to do, there, there's a way in Canvas that I can basically import another course's material into a course. So I'll do that. So everything you're seeing here and we'll see on the recording, you'll be able to do in the directed studies Canvas site later. So here's our home page. Um, and go over to assignments. And there's the four four labs that are the uh, 
those are the only things that you get marks for other than there's a presentation at the end of the term that you do not a paper but a like a powerpoint presentation for 15 minutes that's 20 percent of your mark but again I'll, I'll make sure you have the link to the syllabus you do um, so that you're good to go so lab one which as it says here is not due until Monday, the 29th of January at 11.59 p.m. Um, when I was a young prof, I used to have papers and assignments due at midnight. Only, of course, in those days, I would be sitting there in my office and I was in a little building separate from the main bio building at midnight waiting for students to come to the door with their assignments. Thankfully, those days are over. <laughs> okay. okay, so here's lab one. So what I want to do is I'll just briefly, for these first couple, just briefly, um, first one, I guess, talk about that and make sure everybody kind of is good with uh, getting that one done if you haven't already. So this is, you know, you're looking, everybody here uh, has either in your research area, including you, Omar, Judy, I don't know, you're not doing an honors thesis, I don't think, but you've experienced finding scientific papers. And, and what you have to do here is really simple. Um, a lot of what I talked about in the first lecture was kind of the way ways to portray data you know whether it's the typical value or the variability and stuff like that and what i want you to do is in a scientific paper find what you think and that's the emphasis what you think is a great figure or table and just do a screenshot of that like clip it do a screenshot stick that in your in your assignment doc uh, and then uh, find an example of what you think is a horrible figure or table and the obvious point i'm trying to make is uh, in your di discipline specific what do you think is really what figure or table you think is really good at getting across the message they're trying to get across in that figure or table and so you've got to put two figures there and then you got to tell me in a couple of sentences why why do you think this is a horrible figure or why do you think this is a great figure i might not agree with you by the way so that's why you know even though this is stats you might think well you know it's either going to be right or wrong finally i get daily to mark something where it's not so bloody subjective <laughs> and uh but you can tell me that a figure, you think this figure is really good. And I can say, well, I don't think so, but I'm not going to penalize you because I don't agree with you. Right. But you have to tell me, you can't just say, here it is. I think it's great. Say why you think it is. And so any, any questions about that? Is everybody good with that? Um, well, I, I guess, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you always want the rubric, I'm never going to give it to you. So, well, put it this way, if you say, I think this is a great figure because, you know, the contrasting bars on the plot, we're not talking like sophisticated molecular biology or whatever. Every figure, every table is trying to communicate something. And you're going to tell me why you think this figure or table is communi communicating what they seem to be clearly or horribly. So you might say, yeah, this table is terrible because there's 47 rows, there's tiny type, and it doesn't really put in adjacent columns what they're trying to compare. So it's hard for me to see 
the message they're trying to get across. Same thing with a figure. Um, Levy, it was you that sent me the figure with the 47 lines going across from the data of the taper study. So I might say, I might say with that figure, um, I hate this figure because I don't know what she's trying to say with it. She's got all the data here. She's and and you'll see that. Sorry to pick on you, but I'll do it again. I'll do it many times. But you know, because especially with figures, um, and I would say not to be mean or anything, but especially sometimes with theses, undergrad or grad theses, sometimes people draw figures because they want to say, look at how much work I did. You know, and my point is, and you even see that in published papers sometimes. So my point is, uh, are they communicating something clearly with this figure table or not? And what about it makes it great? And again, I might disagree with you, but I'm not going to say what you said is wrong, so therefore is zero. So if you if you say this is a great figure, this is why I think it's great, you get full marks, A plus on the question. And as usual, and you know, it's too neat that. So I don't I don't think I have the uh, knowledge or expertise to say yeah this this is eighty three and this is eighty two, or you know, and and that of course leads to somebody saying where where did I lose that mark. <laughs> So my ability, the limit of my abilities, I think, even down to the individual questions in the labs is, is it A plus, is it A, is it A minus, you know, that. So with number one, it's, you know, if you got a good and crappy figure and reasons why you think it's that, you get A plus, okay? Is that good, Emily? You can just, and you know something I discovered with Zoom? If I put my hand up, no, oh, did this this morning. It put my virtual hand up. I guess I turned that off. You know. It was actually kind of spooky. I was talking to one, another one of my honors thesis students that I did something like stretch and all of a sudden that yellow hand came up and I'm what? Anyway, okay. So are we good good with that one? Okay. The next one, and we've been through this. I've been through this, I think, with most people. I just want to, um, and we'll we'll do the R stuff in a second, but this is the data set. And Judy, I think you're saying like you just made up data. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna get you to move up here. <laughs> you don't. You don't yell. You don't like yelling at me, so I'm gonna get you to sit here. So I can hear you. Anyway, um, so this is gonna work if you just make up the data, but it because I want. Well, you're you're only gonna kind of have fun with this. And believe me, it'll be fun. Um, if you either use like I think all three of you are using data from your kind of research area. Is that right? Or yeah, yours. Yeah, it's something to do with fish. Yeah. <laughs> um. But oftentimes, and that is, I think that was true of you as well, Emily. Yeah, I'm using my own data. So, um, which is great, because the, the reason for that is it kind of, I find you understand the, the stuff that you do more if you're actually familiar with the data. And it'll also, hopefully be helpful when you're doing stuff later after after the course. But lots of people as well um, get like stats on basketball players or whatever um, for the same kind of thing. 
but and I, I think back in the day I even had people do remember I was talking I think it was last week about going out and asking first years how old they were so <laughs> several years ago and I don't think you can do this now because of ethics or something <laughs> but um no grad students would go to the cafeteria and do like surveys and then use that data so that's not happening but you but you can you know i've had people collect data on well i've got the example of movies in here or professional sports players or whatever yeah so something like and we can talk offline about what you might use where you might get data but um something real other than just made up <laughs> don't worry I've, I've made up a lot of data in fact I, che I checked with you know we as an example I use Mike Thorne's uh, salmon data in the R scripts that talked about and I was just in contact with Mike making sure that I had permission to use it because he took the course like 10 years ago 10 12 years ago and I said to him I don't actually remember if the, there's a variable, which is whether or not there's a lamprey attached to the fish. Um, and I said, Mike, I don't remember whether this is actually a variable. I just made it up, <laughs> like, like just as an example. But um, he has got back to me on that. I don't think he's speaking. To me. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the key thing here, and it tends to be the trickiest thing for people, and I think we've worked it out with those who got data, is this distinction between, I mean, categorical versus predictor is pretty, pretty clear. Categorical is just, you know, is it in this group or that group or that group, you know, two or more groups that your observation can be put into one of them. Um, but, and quantitative is pretty clear. You measure it on some kind of scale. But um, the distinction that tends to be hard for people is predictor versus response. And response, sometimes called the, um, what's it called? De like an intro stats, the dependent variable versus the independent variable, which I don't like that terminology, but you've heard that. And the weirdest part of it for people usually is, uh, a categorical response variable. You know, so it's one thing to say, yeah, we're going to predict um, the the weight of a fish given their length and the height of the body and, and that kind of stuff. That kind of feels like regression or something like that. That's good. But thinking of a categorical response, we're going to predict, um, I think the example I used in the next lab, uh, is, is something like the uh, the category of vehicle SUV versus compact, given the mileage and other things about it. So um, that tends to be one that's that's harder for people to wrap their heads around. Um, but those of you who do work in some way on tox toxicology studies, for example, you know that. You do stuff like bioassays, whether they're lethal, sublethal, and that's an example of a categorical response variable. Did the thing die or not die, given that it had this concentration of the toxin in the environment, and it was this sex of fish or whatever? So, um, so in this in this uh, spreadsheet that you have, like the other problem people have before I get to that is uh, if they're using data from their area, they got. They got too much data. You know, they got, oh, I got all these variables. They're, what I need is somewhere in there, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. So um, I, I think I've had a couple of people confirmed already, but make sure before you go too far that you've sent me an email, not to check on stuff or if I say, yeah, maybe think about this or this, this but that I've actually said, yeah, this looks good because I don't want, sometimes people don't do that and they do the rest of the lab and then it just causes challenges later. So um, as anybody at this point, those of you who got this far, uh, anybody having a major problem 
with the just the data part. Yeah, Flavia. Well, I think maybe the problem is having a problem showing any sort of value. So I was thinking if I could um, just kind of switch out some of my variables, maybe add temperature and some frost length. Uh, because I have a bunch of other things that we measure, but well, what it's interesting that you, yeah, it's an interesting statement, given that you haven't analyzed stuff yet. But I, I think where you're going with it is, I mean, for all the variables to do something interesting, you need some amount of variability in them, right? Like if it's, um, if it's the same category. <laughs> all the way down, then you're not going to be able to do much analysis of that. If, you know, if it was all females in the study or whatever. Um, and the other problem that happens the odd time is that two variables are perfectly correlated with each other. We talked, we had a couple of examples of that um, last week where, uh, and it often happens, people say, okay, I've got this quantitative variable, now I'll divide that up into groups. And there's my categorical variable. And think about it, those two things are actually expressing the same information two different ways. But um, whatever you do in sorting that out, if you could just send me the sheet that you come up with, then I'll just make sure that it's okay. And, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I've already <laughs> well, the nice thing, uh, and this, uh, you know, every project that I've done, as I was saying last time, doesn't matter how sophisticated it is or what, you know, I did this study, just published this paper on 25 years of biomonitoring studies in BC at hundreds of sites and everything uh, with a uh, a friend of mine, and we spent 95% of the time organizing the data. You know, this is data from five different uh, regions of BC Ministry of the Environment, all, all this stuff. So you can imagine data sets coming in everywhere. So organizing the data, getting it ready, and then ultimately doing these analyses in R. And we, and once you've got to the point where the data are there, even changing variables or whatever, you know, going back to the spreadsheets, oh, that's screwed up. I got to do that and then re read the data. That's that's a breeze. Um, so even if I said, oh, you can't use that variable, and and you think, oh, I got to go back and rerun these graphs, it's nothing. Once you've got it all set up and you know, you know, this variable. That's one of the reasons, and we'll look at this in the R scripts, where I tend to do stuff like say, okay, QVAL is this particular quantitative variable, and then I use QVAL when I'm doing the graph of it. That way I can change it to this other quantitative variable too. But anyway, uh, yeah, just send it to me. I'll, I'll look at it as fast as I can, like tonight, and then, so, yeah. Um, and one last question. Uh, so can I have more than one, for example, one um, response variable in the quantitative side? Like, could I have maybe three quantitative variables? Um, That's the one. Part. Yes. I, and and uh, I think three predictor. So I, I would say no. I'd just say choose one. I mean, so let's just flash forward and hopefully this doesn't scare you too much, but there will be a time when we use uh, the three quantitative predictors as response variables. So that, you know, like, we'll kind of uh, play with stuff once we get to multivariate analysis, that third lab, but I think I just want you to kind of keep things simple. You could have that. I always have a, kind of a, a sheet I'm working on. Maybe you've got the sheet with all the variables, all the data in, it, in the Excel workbook. And then I always copy it 
you know, create another sheet, which is a copy of it. And then I start carving it up, get rid of columns, uh, observations I'm not going to use. That's the one that I'm going to send into R for analyses for lab one. So I, I would just pick one again, just to keep your head, keep things simple. So you've got exactly what I've asked for here. It's not, it's not really about me saying, oh, you know, you have too many response variables. That's B minus. It, it's not really about that. It's, a, it's just keeping it dead simple this way where there's um, eight variables all together, right? One, one uh, response. And the other thing about it is, and I think I asked, yeah, part of number two is this conceptual model thing. And when you think about it, it, it would be easier for you to wrap your head around building some sort of credible conceptual model with one response variable. Okay. And that, so if that's clear with the, the first part of number two, assembly your data. So the provide a conceptual model diagram of your data set and a couple of paragraphs explaining the source of the data and its variables, as well as your conceptual model. So again, uh, as many of you know, um, I'm not someone who likes, I'm not gonna be, uh, less is more when it comes to what you write. So I wanna know where the data, yeah, this data came uh, from our lab and the studies in 2021 or whatever, or this came from this paper or or the study or whatever. I, I don't need, a humongous amount of detail, your methods, all that kind of stuff. Just tell me the source of the data, where it came from. And the conceptual model, um, remember in the, the, the first lecture, you know, I was talking, I think I had mercury in wetlands or something like that. A conceptual model is just stocks and flows. It's not what kind of relationship is there is an inter interaction between this thing and that thing and affecting this other quantitative variable. It's, you're just telling me the direction of causality that you're proposing. Okay. It's not, uh, it's not equivalent to building a statistical model or regression or anything. This is just your, in your crazy head about the, the, the fish data here, here's what I think contributed to, and that goes a long way in straightening out for people, usually, the difference between this response and predictor variable. Because, you know, it's, unless we're talking about, uh, I guess, snapping turtles and sex determination, you know, sex of the individual, the animal is usually not a response variable, it's a predictor. So. Yeah, the sex of the animal caused this, I think, causes this differential response in terms of this hormone level, this um, size variable or whatever. So, again, with the conceptual model, um, I'm very liberal in marking it. It's, you know, it's going to have your variables there, these eight variables, and kind of how they you think that they work together in determining the response variables. And think about the basketball player or the, the movie example, I think that I've got here, where it's gross income. It's actually a great example for right now since the nominations just came out. So gross income of a movie and whether or not it won an Oscar. Those are the two response variables that I have there. And so think about those two variables as, a, as kind of the endpoint of a conceptual model. And how do you think um, the budget of the film, uh, the Rotten Tomato score, um, I don't know, some other quantitative variable that reflects the, uh, the number of big stars that are in it or whatever. So how do those things, and this is a pretty simple conceptual model. It could be just those predictors pointing towards the gross and whether or not it gets an Oscar. You're not talking about the magnitude of the effect. You're not talking about um, whether it's positive or negative. You're just talking about, here's my concept about how these things link together. It could be kind of 
two links in a chain so that the uh, the the film budget affects the you think affects the Rotten Tomato score, which then affects the the gross or whatever. But it's your concept of what you think is going on in your research area. And I find, honestly, I hate to say this, but honest, that process can be as useful for me in understanding something I'm working on than actually analyzing the data. Doesn't that sound scary? So me, me thinking about, and for a long time, uh, and you know, many papers I've written, I didn't really go through this that way. So, yeah, this is what people measure. I'll go and measure. This is how they analyze it. And this is the sort of conclusions they make. I sort of do that. I kind of feel like I did this intuitively, but not really. And I learned so much when I started just taking time without being worried about whether I have to prove it in my thesis defense or whatever. But just this is what I think is going on. And then you run it by your supervisor. They say, actually, you got this totally backwards. And that's great. But that, yeah, it tends to be a useful process, which is why I'm forcing you to do it. So if, and and like everything else with us, um, let's say you do that, you sketch that out and you're thinking, oh God, I'll hand it in. Here goes nothing. Um, like send me what you think beforehand. I'm not going to say uh, it's such and such a mark, but I will say, um, yeah, you're getting there. Um, and have you thought about this or this this thing's missing or whatever? So send me your crappy stuff or what you think might be crappy, and I'll give you my honest opinion of it if it's before it's handed in. And like I said, you know, if you hand this in and it's stinks then i'll give you also give you my honest opinion and you can hand it in again then it becomes uh and people always say oh well, that's not like real life you know what what people talk incredibly patronizingly like as if you know you're raising toddlers or something but um it is like real life like um you know you you can uh make it better with uh, iterations. Okay. Any questions about the conceptual model thing? Okay. Emily, you're good with that? Okay. Wonderful. All right. Let's get down to the nitty gritty and this incredibly, uh, I know my friend Judy here is going to be looking for a rubric for number three, which is, uh, and I quote, provide tables and figures of unspecified numbers and types that describe each quantitative and categorical variable and explore relationships between pairs of them. <laughs> this is funny even to me. Um, do a one page result style interpretation of these tables and figures. So um, there, there's a lot packed in here and that this, question, as simple as it is, has evolved a lot over the years, um, because so it used to be, as I think everybody's seen, or most of you have seen now, there's a set of R scripts that I have, and we'll look at a few of them in just a minute. Um, and so what people used to do is, okay, here's this R scripts, I'm going to put my data in there, I'm going to do them all with every possible combination. And I'll churn that out, and he better be happy because I've done everything. And um, I was variably happy about that. But the po point here is um, more if you were writing a paper about this and you don't yet have the burden, and this scares some people, weirdly, you don't have the burden of any actual statistical tests or analysis here. And I really, this is intentional. Because I want you to I keep emphasizing um, looking at the data and ways to show the data in figures, whether they be box plots or bivariate plots or whatever. And you're doing the scary thing, which people sometimes think is, is wrong, is 
you're doing a results section and that's what I want it to be. It's, it's like, you know, when you write that results section, you're, you're pointing out things and figure you're not repeating what's in the table or the figure you're pointing out stuff that's interesting or noteworthy in the figure or the table in the text of the results. And you're saying, so, um, it looks like there is a difference between, uh, in, in, uh, the Oscars winning movies in their, uh, geez, I can't think of, uh, and so Oscar winning movies tend to have a much higher budget than non Oscar winners, but, uh, it's, it's extremely variable, you know, whatever. And then figure four. So that's the kind of statement that I want in this. And I'm not going to say, Hey, they didn't say anything about, you know, Rotten Tomatoes score uh, correlating with film budget or something, you know, so it's up to you. You've got the data set. You've got some tools to communicate uh, what is in the data set to me. So use that. And then uh, the absolute worst thing to do is create a bunch of great graphs or figures and just, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever read or um, produced paperwork. Here's the results, figure one, figure two, figure 13, figure 14. You know, there, look at look at the brilliant stuff I've done discussion. So you need, absolutely need a results text, right? And it's, like I said, it's not, figure two shows the means and the variability uh, in different types of movies in their uh, gross at the bo box office. So the text doesn't say exactly what the figure is, but it says figure two shows that that uh, action movies tend to gross much more than um, dramedies or whatever. So you're actually, again, it's all about communicating the results. So if you have the the two together, you know, you you look at your data and say, okay, how do I want to get Bob and myself familiar with what's in this data set? I want them to. You know, I want us both to go away feeling like we know what's going on in this data set prior, again, prior to doing any of those analyses that you've all heard of, whether it's ANOVA or regression or anything like that. I just want to feel like, no, oh, yeah, this looks like this is going on, or this is, this group's much more variable than that group, that, that kind of thing. And show that to me. So, um, and again, if if you're worried about, uh, you know, have I done enough or have I done too much or whatever, again, just check with me. I mean, we got a small enough class you just say, well, I've done this, this, is that enough? Like, and here's kind of how I'm writing the results up. And yeah, I said, yeah, yeah, you're definitely on the right track. Okay, or, I think you should do a bit more. I mean, like one scatter plot, probably not enough for me to feel like I know the data set, but okay. So let's let's uh, start doing it. So I'll just take a couple of minutes uh, and stop talking for a minute and I'm gonna get my R screen up. So if everybody could, oh, right here. <laughs> um, if everybody could, if they have it, sort of get into R with their stuff so we can we can share stuff um, if you've got it done or uh, problems that you might have them. But, but meanwhile, I'm just, I'll go through and sort of give you with those scripts that are available and I'll, uh, I think I have it now. I just, I just went through a reno of my uh, cloud storage. Uh, hopefully it didn't bring the whole empire down, <laughs> but um, I'll put a link to these different scripts that I show you in the chat room so that you can go there and then download. If you haven't got them some other way, you know what I mean? It worked well when I did it with uh, one of my honor students the other day. Yeah. 
I, I don't think so, but even if they have, uh, it, you know, though they still work, so you should be fine because you're going to have to alter them anyway. Well, I guess it sounds like you already have. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe as I go through them, yeah, it's not like, oh, this looks totally different kind of thing. So, and as always, um, like I always say, this isn't a course on learning R, but you'll know it by the time you're done. And I strongly encourage, since I'm not like an R guru, I use it a lot, but um, really uh, for sure, uh, keep an eye on, keep cross-checking with um, both the R for data science and the GG plot books. They're really good, simple. The other thing I use all the time when I'm doing stuff, and those of you who have started at this, I'm sure have done it. You're trying to remember, I was trying to remember uh, this morning because one of our colleagues, uh, Hira is merging two data sets, right? And she's got one data set that's got, um, oh, uh, lakes and sites within lakes. That's That's the whole data set. You know, a bunch of sites where E. coli samples are taken. The other data set is like sites and actual E. coli concentrations. So one data set is information about the sites. The other one is E. coli concentrations. So doing a merge of those two data sets is easy, but I just forgot, I forgot the command line. So what you do, you just Google and I'll, I'll show you on, since we're sharing screen right now, I think I'm sharing my whole desktop. So um, my screen's visible to you folks now, right? So how do you merge two data sets in R by uh, categorical? And and you know it, this this just gets all those people in their basements working on. Uh, working on R and, and lots of folks and courses, places, yeah, to merge two data sets horizontal. And the cool thing is, um, you know, with, with most resources like that, right on the screen, you can sort of sweep over it and copy it. And I'll go over to R here. And you can, you can paste that right into a script that you're building which I've already done here. I'll just delete that. So that was just copied and pasted from somebody who, somewhere who told me how to merge two. So I can kind of do that and then I'll adjust it with my data set names and that. And, and that goes for the simplest thing like merging two files to quite complicated stat or plotting things that forgot how to put the name of the site against beside the plotting figure. So I'll go find that and then I'll copy it into my plotting script, a really good way to, to get help. Okay. So let's, uh, it's 3.03. Um, the very first thing that we did, and I, I think most people who at least got their data together are, are beyond this phase is, um, well, the very, very first thing we did was uh, set up a project in R, which everybody should. And as I said before, and I'll say it many times annoyingly, uh, really be very fastidious about managing your data and managing all these R scripts and everything. Um, because even in the time, you know, this the world of our course is tiny, right? You got this tiny data set you're going to be using stuff, but it'll quickly mushroom, you know, you have different versions of all these scripts and everything. You don't want to have um, who is. Was it your desktop, Omar? That was a total uh, yeah, chaotic mess. Yeah, <laughs> really. Look, it you know desktops today they're like stickers on laptops. <laughs> you 
it's a window into the organization and you you really have to organize stuff and it's a great model for what you can do like when you're working on your honors thesis stuff or or your um master's thesis stuff is just keep it organized and and uh it'll really pay off okay so i have this project um called grad stats r and as i was explaining and, and if you're unsure about the whole thing about setting up a project and that uh check out i think i did that in the first week hands-on but also hadley wickham's book the, the r for data science explains it quite well but basically whether you're on a mac or a pc or whatever um it's it's like a folder that you have dedicated to our scripts and data and whatever else you want in it. And you can see there, if you look in the bottom right corner, it's just my, obviously my R Studio screen. I've got four subfolders in this uh, grad stats R project named after the four labs. So if I go into lab one, that's where uh, Mike's uh, Chinook salmon data is. And that's where that's where the scripts, and you don't have to limit yourself to these scripts. It's probably, if you haven't used R before, that's probably the most comfortable for you. Um, I'll definitely be uh, impressed with people who just, you know, they write new stuff here um, and, uh, and such. But my approach, like I say, because it isn't a kind of a, learn our course is to give you these scripts so these are free packages we've already talked about sets of commands for r and uh, they do various things so your your challenge initially anyway is to modify them to uh, use them on your data sets so the very first thing to do is reading saving exporting the data set and as we talked about already when you click on something, this bottom right corner is really just like File Explorer. That's where the files and folders that are in your project are sitting. I clicked on the reading, saving, labeling, exporting a data set dot R, that script, and it appears up in the top left corner there. And uh, that's, again, it's like a text file. It's a series of commands for R. And what this one does is as i mentioned just reads the data from a spreadsheet we looked at spreadsheets last week of people's data sets um and those of you who haven't got your data yet again note that this command in line number 10 here is reading that excel spreadsheet with uh, mike's chinook salmon data in it into r like it's bringing it into this stats software then for for further work on it. So in our studio, I can execute a few commands at a time. So I'll do that with these first few lines. And then what's happening down below there, it's like a report on what R is doing and it's read the data, the Chinook salmon data into R and called it Chinook. And in the top right, you see variables and data sets that have are in use in R right now. And the only one that's there is Chinook and it's 80 observations of eight variables. And if I tap this little miniature spreadsheet here, then it appears as a tab over on the left, all those variables and, and all that. So we've, we've done that already. The only other thing we do in this script is you can label variable names to remind you what those variables are about and you can see where i've labeled the different fish variables there and you can also label different categories of categorical variables which i've done in the next set of lines and the final thing that i do is take that data set along with the labels and save it as what's called an r data set and that's what line 41 is the other thing that's possible is to write an Excel file that has the labels on it. And that's what these following lines do. But anyway, so I'll take all that and run it. And I end up with, if you look again at my files over in the bottom right corner there, I have uh, this Chinook 
table.rds that I'm pointing to with the Mickey Mouse hand right now, that's the R data set that has the labels in it. So um, I'll just pause. And those of you who, who are started with R, I'm going to presume that you've been able to get your data into R through this or a modified version of this. Is that correct? Are we good there? And those of you who aren't there yet, once you do, uh, I'm there to help you if you get stuck with it. And I know, Emily, you're good on this because I think you were there last week. Okay, so that's great. We've run that script, that little set of commands. So I'm going to I'm gonna shut it. I'll leave the data set up just for, for uh, reference. And if you look over in the bottom right now, there's several things that I do with the data. And this is where you can come up with stuff to get. You don't have to use all of these. Um, in fact, probably just a couple are necessary because some of them are redundant, like this one that just does a bivariate, or sorry, a box plot of a quantitative variable. That's just, I think it's just doing one box plot, but let me just run it. So I'll spare you the details of this, but I specify a quantitative variable here to do the box plot of. And just stuff like titles and subtitles on the graph and, and things like that. And it's reading, the data that it's reading is this R data set that um, I set up, I created in that, that first uh, script that we ran. So let me run that, we'll see if it works. So there it is, it's not too exciting, but it's beautiful. And what I would do, and this is just an example, same thing with the other one, other scripts we'll talk about. So obviously you will have read in your data with your variable names and, and labels and so on that makes sense for your data set. So I won't bore you with all of, you know, you see ggplot, which is actually creating the box plot here. Um, but you also see a nice, uh, y-axis label there, fork length in millimeters. I mean, this, this with different words, you could publish this in a journal article, right? And you can take that plot. I mean, what I do most commonly, I copy it to the clipboard, copy that, go over, I'm making my lab assignment one, uh, And you know, stick it in there, and then I'll, I'll put a uh, caption on it, and then on I go. So it's very easy to get stuff um, from R into into like a Word doc, or you know, as you're building your your assignment submission. But all these little details, you know, like when you say see geome box plot width equal 0.5 all that stuff yeah if you want to kind of deconstruct that look in gg plot for the the um how this the so-called grammar of graphics and how i'm varying the size for example of the text that's on the y-axis one of the comments i got when i submitted that the article for publication on the bc streams, I think I was talking about it a week or two ago, um, was the text on your axes too small. So, you know, figure out how to jack up that size and not jack up everything. You know, all, all that kind of stuff is variable. We were talking about color palettes earlier. Um, the, so all of it's variable. I, I don't want to take the time to kind of go into all the components of a box plot and all that. I think the best way for you to do this is get what you need and then start varying some of the uh, options to get a feel for how you can, again, get that maximum clarity of your figure when you're producing it, not just for this lab, obviously, but for other presentations of, of other data that you want to make. Um, and then, of course, save this script. Once you've changed it to be yours, save it and call it something different. So you've, you've 
got your unique setup done, you might want to do in this case a box plot of uh, all your quantitative variables, and and so you're going to rerun this, substituting the names of different quantitative variables as you do, and then taking the plot and uh, sticking it into your lab submission. Um, probably more likely, again, in terms of one of the things you'll look for when you look for great and horrible figures is there's kind of a sweet spot between over complex figures. They're trying to get across too much information. That can be a problem that you might have with what you call a terrible figure. But some figures don't take advantage of, you know, the opportunity. There's too little information. So um, if we look at uh, group box plots, this is, again, I think I showed this one last week. Um, this is an example of trying to uh, trying to get as much information as possible into a figure uh, without making it overly complex. So let me run it and we'll just take a closer look at it. And this is also an example of getting some stats as well for a table, if that makes sense. So if I go to the plots tab, we see this beautiful um, two by two figure. And notice the snout height in millimeters. So a nice label of the Y axis, exactly the same scale for all four of these sets of box plots and same structure in each of those four panels. That is you've got, yes, there was a lamprey attached on the left and no, there wasn't a lamprey attached on the right. Um, and then you've got the first column of two panels are uh, male fish, and the second column of two panels are female fish, and then immatures are in the first row, and then um, mature or ripe fish are in the second row. So this this is probably with this data set, this is a figure I would use with the three, I think there's three quantitative variables in this case. So have that pattern for each of them, because I'm I'm seeing here, and this is the kind of interpretation that I would make if I was writing the results section. So I'm looking at this and saying, okay, um, in terms of snout height, uh, there wasn't much difference, and I'm, I'm winging this. So there wasn't much difference in the median snout height between um, immatures and ripe fish, but there was much more variability in ripe fish. See how the box is higher in virtually every group except maybe the immature and ripe females that did not have a lamprey attached. So the but so I'm looking for the information there, and you're seeing multiple dimensions of information, but you know, like quite a clean formatted figure where it it's coming out clearly. So if I had snout height, I think the other was the other two quantitative variables were four flank and hump height. If you have exactly the same format of them, then you can really summarize a lot of information quite compactly. So again, it's a matter if that if presentation of some of your data makes sense in that way, then use that format maybe for each of your quantitative variables um, so you're seeing how they vary or if they if they vary across different levels of your categorical variables yep Randy. yeah Yeah, um, so short answer is yes. Uh, and and you'll see that, I think, in the bivariate plot that I'm going to show you. So the, the key is in, and the, the box plots are a little bit, um, 
they're a little bit complicated. If you look at the uh, this chunk here, um, so box plots by default are actually uh, at 90 degrees to this. So that's why it says cord, cord flipped in line 26 there. But you do have uh, X label, Q bear title. That's where it's getting actually the snout height. And then the Y label, which should be the categorical variable title. And it's not there because of the faceting that I'm doing. But there is a way to add text. Um, you can actually put uh, a variable in that. See the subtitle under Mike Thorne Chinook Salmon data set, where it says grouped box plots on the plot itself. So that could say, you know, sorted by lamprey attached or not, or something something like that. But um, yeah, it it depends on the 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 faceting uh, affects it but that's something that's something i would ask like google it say i've got a faceted plot i want to put um i want to put uh, a label on the x axis in this case how do i do that and basically you you'll get a suggestion as you can see here like the ggplot command it's a series with plus signs and you'll, so somebody will tell you how to modify those to get that text in there. Yeah. yeah. I've tried to put as much, uh, that, that's why I put stuff like the subtitles in and that as much in so you can maybe get an ability to put in what you think might be important and, and get rid of it if it's not gonna add anything. Like the subtitle doesn't really add anything in that that I've got there, but let's take a look at the uh, bivariate plot. Is that, and in a sec, those of you who haven't got it these, I'll, I'll uh, as I was saying, I'll put a link to them in the chat room so you can connect to them. Okay, this is, uh, so bivariate plot is always about one quantitative variable versus the other, sort of X, Y, classic X, Y plot. And this has got a bit of a twist to get more information out of it. So I'll run that and you can see what. Okay. And um, so I'm, I'm always trying to do this because um, again, it's that, it's that, trying to be efficient, getting a lot of information, but not too much across in one plot. Um, and we can quibble about how, you know, how big the text is, but what you see on there, you've got snout height millimeters on the Y axis, fork length and millimeters on the X axis. And you've got uh, the identification tag on the fish. So we know that uh, SIM up here is, the big fish in it. But you also have, ironically, because we were talking about color scales, um, a very subtle difference in color, at least in my eyes, between yes, there was a lamprey attached and no. Um, and you can see the legend up there above the, above the plot. And it is possible, I don't have it on here, but it is possible to have that the legend include lamprey attached question mark kind of thing. And then the yes and the no on, on top of the plot. So if you think about it again, we're, we're talking about looking at data and making some, uh, getting some information from the data prior to doing the, like, you know, I haven't talked about regression yet, obviously, or anything like that. And that that's exactly what I'm trying to push you to do is not, you know, there's people who say, well, I can't, I can't say anything until you tell me what the R squared is there or anything like that. I just want you to look at it and say, well, yeah, I, even though I can't really see color, I don't think I see any, um, no lamprey or see very few no lamprey attached in sort of the lower quarter of these. There's one there, there's one there. So just looking at what 
the data suggests, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, that there's obviously a, you know, it's a, a kind of a noisy positive relationship between these two morphometric measures, but looking for more, more information, uh, you know, prior to doing, we'll, we'll do the usual regression and, and such stuff like that. But I think it's always a good idea to look at what you can see in the data prior to that, that kind of analysis. And again, look at look in the details of the plot for um, how how you can label things. And it, actually, it's interesting. I do use a color palette there, um, so it's just the way that uh, ggplot and other graphics uh, functions here use color. So that line twenty one twenty two there is. Um, creating a palette of colors, which is like a vector of, of different color codes. And then if you look down in the uh, the uh, actual ggplot set of commands, line 28 is where I say, okay, I wanted to use from my palette that I've defined up top there, I wanted to use colors six, five, eight, and seven for the four colors. Um, that it's using there. So all sorts of stuff you can vary. And um, I guess here is kind of the main line for this bivariate plot where you see the X variable is what I call Q var X. That's the um, fork length. And the Y variable Q var Y is um, the snout height. And the color, the color of the point is does it have, did it have a lamprey attached? Yes or no. So when you, if you want to use a bivariate plot and most people it, it's useful if you have a, you know, two or more bivariate plots to sort of show bivariate relationships between let's say your quantitative response variables and each of your three um, quantitative predictor variables, then think of what might be an interesting color to make the point. So you're getting a little more information across um, in that in that bivariate plot. And you can also put a tag on. So the tag that I got, which right now is just fish ID, the ID number, could be the sex of the fish, it could be the population that it came from. Um, so yeah, use that and, and you'll find those variable names from the from Mike's uh, data set uh, in that plot. And that's what I mean by like play around with modifying these scripts. I think I think that'll be helpful relative to starting from scratch and then um, get it so you're you're creating a clear idea of, of what your data set looks like. Uh, what other one did I want to show you? Oh, um, going back a ways with the um, with the group box plots. If you look in the lower left corner, and I'll go back to that script for a sec. So in that script, you know, we basically all of this preliminary stuff here was loading the data set and then establishing just the title for the plot and the variables that I was going to use, quantitative and categorical, and then running the box plot. That's great. But the other thing I wanted to show you with this one is just doing basic stats by the groups. And um, so that's what these last lines 29 to 32 are. It's just some basic summary stats from uh, groups that include the population, the sex, the ripeness of the fish, and um, uh, this quantitative variable in this case, uh, which one did I use here? Oh, the... Um, 
what was the box plot of snow snow type so that table which is um you know it's telling you the mean median uh standard deviation of each of those uh subgroups and obviously you can't you can't take this and stick it as is and this is again a kind of a a lesson for doing the lab but also in doing uh papers that you that you write um always be careful if you are creating or if you're using a table of some kind in in your lab or in stuff that you publish or reports that you do um be really cautious about um significant figures um that the the rule of thumb and I, everybody's probably heard or learned rules of thumb with respect to reporting significant figures um so you're if you're reporting means and standard deviations, you can report, and let's say uh, measuring something on a kilogram scale to the nearest, and your scale works to the nearest tenth of a kilogram, pretty crude scale, um, then you can use one more decimal place with a mean or a standard deviation than what the data for individuals is actually recorded as. For p-values, once we get to significance tests and all that, people famously um, put whatever p-value, you know, they put it to the number of decimal places that's reported in the stats software. Um, so just use two significant figures. And if it's if p is less than 0 0.001, just say it's less than 0 0.001. So don't say it's 0.0000. 5268456 but anyway the my, the main thing for the purposes of this lab since we don't have uh p values is spend if you do use tables spend as much time worrying about their clarity and especially with regard to formatting of of uh, numbers that are there and significant figures they have as you do worrying about the clarity of figures Uh, I'm running out of gas here. So questions, people, have you run all these, Emily, or your own versions of them? Uh, most of them, yes. I just haven't. I think I've done a couple of bivariate plots, but I haven't used uh, like an ID tag. It's usually just like kind of not linear, like, like linear regressions between quantitative variables. You've muted yourself. Anybody here who has used uh, any of the scripts out of the read? Yeah, I ran them all. For fun. Was... So far, so good? Yeah. Good. Just other than the... Yeah, I can show. Any okay. preference? Of which one? Okay. Um, I have this one open so I can share my screen. Group bar chart thing. Yeah, so I have it grouped by the uh, breed of bird and the foraging style, and it's showing the relative frequency and the success. So whether they were successful at foraging or not. So. Any species there? Um, I think eight. Oh no, yeah, there's nine. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, so some of the species have the same foraging style. So you can see the first four all use perch diving to catch their fish. And then the sandpiper is the only one that does the shoreline pecking. The green heron is a slow stalker. And the snowy egret runs in the shallow water. And same with the great egret. And then the black neck still pecks at the surface water. So different foraging styles, but some of them are the same depending on the breed of bird. So I, what, what I would do, and this is just friendly advice. Yeah. Because um, as soon as I looked at this, I don't know if it was the same for others, I started thinking. Maybe it's just the way my twisted mind operates. I started to think, okay, is it species across and then method coming down? Like I think uh, with a with a matrix like this, mm -hmm. I guess my my suggestion would be if you're going to go with the nine panels. I would actually get rid of the. Uh, the foraging style because okay. think about it so nine panels would be here's here's the nine species and whether they were successful or not um it's not really letting me easily compare perch diving to shoreline packing you know what i like to yeah that's too much going on yeah well it's just um there's too much for my eyes to do. Mm -hmm. And that, that's why the, having that second phrase, which is important. I mean, somewhere you're going to want to say this is the style each of them use, and maybe compare since you've got more than one perch diver, um, and you've got more than one running or walking. Like, if you could compare just the, the style of fishing or, or hunting mm -hmm. but i think combining the two doesn't work because of that variable number in, in a couple of cases there's just one species that has a certain tactic and i guess that that's what i mean it's and like i say i'm not <laughs> i'm not jumping on you just because you were brave enough no that's okay there. i always go to um like what's getting across information what's maybe too much so it's obscuring and I think actually same plot without the hunting style would be a better plot because then I'm seeing nine species yeah they vary in their success you know? mm -hmm. um, and also I'm seeing that Kiskadi is hunting a lot more than everybody else yeah, there were more kiskadees identified in the um, by the observers. I'm going to see. I might have already done it. Let me check. Um, thought of, I did one of the forging attacks. Maybe that's... No... Okay, I'll mess around with it and try, see if I can just get it on its own. Anybody else want to show us something? <laughs> Maybe can you show us something there if you get ready for prime time? Do you think it looks better like this? Sorry to just ask quickly. If you can still see my screen. <laughs> so relative frequency is how um, their success. So this is for diets and breed, but then I could also do one for success, just to kind of have it easier on the eyes. Yeah, you know, one thing, a technique I use with a bar chart like that is you can have 
success, percent success on the y-axis, the nine breeds across, and then above the bar, and I'll say something, Chocha, that is you could have the number of observations. Mm. So for the the Piscidae, yeah, you know, you're not gonna see that, right? The fact that they were hunting like crazy, mm -hmm. but you will see like 124 versus five and two. So yeah, sometimes when I show box plots, because as I was saying last time, you're not seeing the beauty of a box plot is you see variability. It's not contaminated by how much work you did, how many observations, but it's useful to know how many observations. Yeah. So to have the number over there, like 12 versus 32 and stuff like that can be useful. And you can stick text like that on top. I'll stop sharing so um, Emily can jump in. Thank you for your help. Yeah. Just, uh, Emily, you got something you want to share or no? Yeah, I can share. Um, I think I don't I don't really like this one, I've been trying to figure out a way to um, I think it's still loading. Okay. Is it showing up at all? Oh, there it is. Um, I so this is species richness. Uh, and then I've grouped it by three of my qualitative predictor variables. So like categorical um, level of urbanization, fisheries management zone, and then and whether or not it was an acid damaged or reference lake. But I don't like it because I don't have any urban reference lakes that we sample. So it kind of, it makes the plot a bit awkward. Yeah, and um, let me go back to my. Um, there. Yeah, and, and that I, I'm really glad both of you showed this example, these examples, because they illustrate a couple of things I never would have thought of. Um, so sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes we get too close to the data, if I can put it that way. Um, so um, I don't know if anybody or everybody here knows what a fisheries management zone is, but I can probably guarantee that nobody cares. <laughs> and um, and that, that sounds pretty cruel, but I guess what I'm trying to say, and part of the point of your paper might be this is happening in FMZ 10 versus 11 or whatever, that's fine. But what I would think about for this figure, and, and obviously there's differences in those, right? Like if you look at the acid damaged rural, um, so that may be what you're going for, but that's a long winded way of saying, yes, I sort of similar to Raina's I would worry when you have a faceted graph like this, it's a multi-pane graph, you always have to be careful of, you know, the reader is immediately going to go to, okay, what's across, what's down, and, and they're making comparisons that way. And other than moving the two <laughs> to the right to just illustrate the fact, I mean, it's obvious there's, there's not many acid damaged urban lakes either there's no reference urban lakes there's not there looks like there's one acid damage urban lake. so what i might do with it is actually get rid of it and then just say yeah and the one the one acid damaged urban lake 
uh, had 16 species, you know, sort of just do it that way mm -hmm. in your results. Cause it's not, it's not adding anything and it's making it hard to kind of get a message out of that. Whereas the message, if you had uh, a two by two plot, it's super easy to see a couple of things. One is uh, zone 10 and 11, uh, similar richness in reference lakes, and uh, there's no suburban <laughs> has to damage lakes in zone 11, you know, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. that, that's what I would do in this case where you're, you're lacking, just immediately look at the facet, the multi-panel, the multi-panel's got to do something for you, right? And if yeah. it's not, other than just getting all the data plotted, then you should rethink it. And especially when you've got a lack of data like that, you know, not just the one where there's no plot, but the one in the top left corner, um, I would just put that one in words as I talk about the figure. Yeah. I think part of it too is like zone 10 is Sudbury region, whereas zone 11 is like North Bay Nipissing. So there, there isn't many acid damaged areas within the North Bay Nipissing boundaries. So I think I started myself off on the wrong foot, but I needed yeah. another categorical variable. Well, that, that, that's fine. Um... I mean, one of the things you're finding out about with this initial look of the data is unbalancedness, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, almost every case, um, people are going to be looking at observational data. And um, it's it's good to be aware of that, not just because, you know, oh, what was me? It's unbalanced and, you know, that, but just it gives you a better idea of, of what's there. I might suggest, um, again, I don't know if it's, if I'm unique in this, but rather than saying 10, 11, say, you know, Sudbury and then 10 in brackets or something like that, that just again, to make it more intuitive for the, the reader. But yeah, the main yeah. thing I would, I would work on is that what to plot and, and you probably know about the select command. So you know, for this kind of data, you wouldn't have to change anything about your um, your plotting commands. You just select out, uh, I guess, if lakes, you select out urban lakes, right? So mm -hmm. just keep data that where the uh, the locale is not urban and then just use the same plot command you have and it'll it'll work fine. Okay. But that and so notice <laughs> I hope it's clear like I'm what I'm the sort of analysis I'm going through has nothing to do with you know use this our command or that or gg plot it's really looking at the plot same way as in that first question of the lab like how am I going to react if I see this in a report that Emily's done for uh, MNR or whatever? Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have anything they want, or do you have any others you want to show us, Emily? Uh, I can show some of the the linear uh, plots I've done. Okay. Just run this one really quick. While you're getting those out, I'll just, uh, I'll put in the chat room. Uh, I think I've got this working. <laughs> I think being the operative word um, on my website, the links to the R scripts, that that should work better now in terms of rather than me directly linking to but let me know if you're having trouble getting at those scripts. Um, yeah, I'll I'll work on it. It's been a bit of a pain, but let's see. Oh, okay. So 
Yeah, you're you're cheating a tiny bit here. <laughs> uh, but I'll let it pass. No, I just I know you got the the line of best fit there, which which it's a good a great way for those that haven't done it to uh to know that it's easy within I think did you use yeah, you use GG plot for this. Um so you can make it so that it adds a line. I think this is just the linear regression line, right? Or is it low S curve fitting? Uh, no, just linear regression with no uh, standard error bars or shading. Yeah. yeah, so there's lots of cool stuff. The other the other resource that I'll share in, uh, I guess I'll, I'll stick it on that website with those other resources is there's a, a ggplot cheat sheet, which is pretty good. It's got all the little commands that you can enhance stuff with. But as Emily's showing here, with a bivariate plot, you can add a line of best fit, like a regression line that helps you see, even with the, the, uh, the blue dots <laughs> that are, uh, which are reference lakes, there's not much of a relationship between species richness and maximum depth, but it shows you what that line looks like. There, it looks like, interestingly, more of a relationship with acid damage lakes. Um, anyway, it's easy to add those lines um, to to plots, uh, and we'll we'll get into that later on when we actually do regression uh, between response and predictor. But nice, uh, nice work on the axis labeling and the uh, the legend on the bottom. Um, again, let me quibble a little bit. Can you can you just pull it to the side, Emily? You'll make the plot bigger if you pull the boundary between the plot and the console. You know that sort of uh, vertical bar that separates the plot from the uh, the script and the console on the left. You can kind of pull it to the side. I don't know if you've done that. Before. Yeah, just move it. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And then you can actually grab the top of it and make it bigger that way too. So, I if I if I was quibbling as an editor, I would say um, I might make these two separate plots. It's it's. Uh, it gets a little bit jumbled in between the two with the y-axis label. Yeah. Uh, so the other thing you can do, if, if you want them side by side with the same y-axis scale, which is probably part of, well, maybe part of what you're thinking is uh, you can you can facet it so it's one by two rather than two by one. If you know what I mean, you've got you got one pile on top of the other, and you can have them side by side rather than that, but yeah, just be careful about stuff like that. And again, I'm not, this is not me pre-marking the thing or anything. I'm just looking at it from aesthetics point of view where that the x-axis label uh, in the top plot gets sort of lost in the bottom plot a little bit. You think, is that a title for that one? Or, you know, that yeah. kind of, um, And anything you can do to distinguish whether it's, font size or bold or color, whatever uh, axis labels from the other stuff is also useful. 